say to those that you love if you knew that they would be the last words that you shared with them? Welcome to Through the Bible. I'm Steve Schwetz, and today we begin a very meaningful study of 2 Timothy with our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee. As you know, one of Paul's sons in the faith was a young pastor named Timothy. As Paul waited in prison to be executed, he wrote Timothy words of warning, encouragement, and as always, pointing him to Jesus Christ. Dr. McGee aptly calls this section of Scripture Paul's swan song. And as he'll describe, it has a note of sadness that's not detected in any of Paul's other letters. So stay tuned for this important message and for Paul's own epitaph in chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. But before we do that, I've got my friend, Through the Bible's President Greg Harris, in the studio to talk to us a little bit about what's happening in South America. Yeah, Steve, this is where our ministry to the rest of the world began. In 1973, we launched Spanish. And today, it's, it remains one of the most robust ministries we have. We are on hundreds and hundreds of FM stations. We are distributing solar players. Uh, we are using apps. People are using digital media. And we get tremendous response. Right. From I think it's also one of the few ministries that is broadcast as one of our foreign languages in the U.S. on radio. Still. That is correct. So yeah. in aggregate, I think we're on something like six or 700 local stations throughout North and South America. But, you know, Steve, one of the things we we sometimes don't highlight that I do want to highlight is in this region, we're also broadcasting in Creole, Dutch, English, German, Guarani, Mom, Portuguese, Quechua, Quiche, and Quichua. (laughs) <laughs> so, and some of those sound like they're edible, and some of them sound like they're they, that they they are almost the same thing. But these are all different languages, and and we try to reach as many people as we can, regardless of where they live, because we want to reach people in their mother tongue. Right. Now we've got a bunch of different testimonies. This first one is from uh, John Bandman. He's a missionary with the Evangelical Free Church of Canada, and he works really closely with Transworld Radio Bolivia in their outreach to the Mennonite colonies in Bolivia. So here's yeah, his this report. Yeah, a great report. Solar-powered mega voice players, and we've mentioned that before, how we use those players right. in different parts of the world, are a favorite tool that we used to share God's Word in low German. This is an ideal tool for young Christians to use to listen to as families or in small groups, using the player as a Bible study leader. Thanks to the church and all those who have provided for this project, please pray for these listeners and thank God for his provision. It is very common for Bolivian believers to report that they came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ through listening on a solar radio. Love that. Love that. I've met John Banman, wonderful man, loves the Lord, loves through the Bible. Here's another letter we got. First of all, I want to thank God for the program and the work that you do. My name is Javier. And while driving in my car, I inadvertently, how many times have we heard that, Steve? (laughs) By accident. I inadvertently tuned in to the station where Pastor Montoya, and that's the the Spanish pastor who speaks uh, through the Bible's teaching, was giving the study. Never in my life had I read a complete book of the Bible, despite spending several years in the church. Wow. I know it was not a coincidence, my having tuned into the program. I know it was the Spirit of God leading me. I have been listening to you for three years, and I have understood that religion and a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ are two very different things. Amen. Yes. May the Lord keep blessing your program, and I will continue supporting the program economically to continue being able to reach souls for the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. I think we've got time for one more, Greg. Let me let me get to it. Blessings, my brothers. I have listened to Through the Bible podcasts since 2015, and day after day they continue to be a great blessing for me and my family. I work in a factory, and I'm able to listen to them while I work. A few days ago I had the privilege of receiving the notes and outlines that you sent me. Hopefully those of you in the U.S. are also receiving those notes and outlines. Through them, I am being filled with the knowledge of the Word of God. It gives me wisdom. I also thank God for your efforts, dedication, and sacrifice to carry the gospel to different places of the world through the radio and translating in different languages so that in one way or another, the Word of God is known through all parts of the world. Thank you for teaching me and strengthening my faith. These are just great testimonies, and Steve, we get 
thousands. We get tens of thousands of responses from Latin America. And, you know, one of the questions we often get is, how do you know they're teaching Dr. McGee? Well, that one uh, response that said, I know the difference between religion and a relationship with Jesus, you know they're hearing Dr. McGee's teaching. The other thing I like about it is when you start hearing back in the letters that the listeners have a burden for the Word of God getting out to the ends of the world. Yes, and I know you always encourage our listeners to join the World Prayer Team We are now approaching 10,000 members of that team, and that just thrills our soul. By the way, I was reading uh, recently a a letter from or a text from the Philippines, and the person said, I joined the World Prayer Team. So we do have people literally from around the world who are praying and joining us in this great vision to get the whole word to the whole world. That's wonderful. Greg, why don't you go ahead and pray for us as we begin our program? Father, our hearts are full of joy as we envision your word reaching out and touching people, quote unquote, accidentally. And then they realize that it was you pursuing them and the Holy Spirit speaks to them and saves them. Lord, keep doing that all around the world through our humble efforts. We just offer them to you and ask you to do the mighty things that only you can do. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, one of the reasons that we followed along here in 2 Timothy is because it actually is almost a part of First Timothy, and you have a calendar of events here that I think will help orient you into the position that Second Timothy occupies in the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Now, we have dates something like this, and these are approximate and not given in a dogmatic fashion. Paul was apparently arrested in Jerusalem in 58 A.D. And having spent about three years, he arrived in Rome in approximately 61 A.D. And he spent those three years, of course, in prison, going from one trial to another before different Roman rulers. And then you have that period that's called his first Roman imprisonment, from approximately 61 through 63. And it would seem, though, that we do not have that section in the book of Acts at all. The book of Acts breaks off at the time of his first Roman imprisonment. In fact, I would think at the very beginning of it. Then from approximately 64 to 67, he was released from prison. And I think that during that period, Paul covered a great deal of territory. And we find that it was during that period that he wrote 1 Timothy and Titus, and he did that from Macedonia. And then he was arrested again in about 67 A.D., and he was put to death, beheaded. And before he died, he wrote 2 Timothy, and he wrote that prior to his death in Rome. Now, this second epistle of Timothy is actually, therefore, the deathbed statement of Paul. And the deathbed statement of any individual, it seems to me, has an importance which is not attached to his other remarks. This is, I think, what lends significance to second Timothy. It's the deathbed communication of Paul. It's his final message. And there's a note of sadness, I think, which is not detected in his other epistles. But there's also the overtone of triumph. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. That's Paul's epitaph, and he wrote it himself. Now, this epistle is very personal. There is approximately 25 or 27 people mentioned by name, which is quite interesting in just four chapters. So it makes this epistle a tremendous epistle, therefore, and we do want to listen to its message in a very definite way. Now, I believe that there are certain verses here, two of them, that sound the tone and give the theme of this particular epistle. The first one is 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And then the other is 2 Timothy 4, 2. Preach the word, 
Be diligent in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. So that these are very important words that we have in this epistle here. And you can, I think, emphasize one word here above other words. That is the word loyalty. And you have loyalty in suffering in chapter 1, loyalty in service in chapter 2, and loyalty in apostasy in chapter 3 down through chapter 4, verse 5. And then from the rest of the book, the Lord loyal to his servants even in desertion. Now, the thing that hangs like an ominous cloud over the book, it's like a cloud way under in the distance. Remember, Elijah sent his servant to see there was a cloud coming. And he came back and says, there's a cloud about the size of a man's hand. And uh, Elijah said to his servant and also to old Ahab, he said, you better get your hip boots. It's going to rain. And believe me, there's a weather prophet that knew what he was talking about because it rained and the drought was over. And what you have in this little book of Second Timothy is the apostasy, a dark cloud on the horizon. Now, that has broken like a storm, like a tornado, a Texas tornado on the world today and in the church. Now, what do you mean by apostasy? Well, Webster defines apostasy as total desertion of the principles of faith. And as we indicated back in the first epistle, apostasy is not due to ignorance. It's a heresy. Apostasy is deliberate error. It is intentional departure from the faith. An apostate is one who knows the truth of the gospel and the doctrines of the faith, but he has repudiated them. He has rejected them. Now, Paul here in 2 Timothy speaks of the ultimate outcome of gospel preaching. The final fruition will not be the total conversion of mankind, nor will it usher in the millennium. On the contrary, there will come about an apostasy which will well nigh blot out the faith from the earth. And in fact, there are two departures at the end of the age. One is the departure of the church, which is called the rapture by Paul, caught up to meet the Lord in the air. That's a departure. And that leads to the departure of the organization, the old shell of the church that's left down here, a total departure from the faith that enabled the Lord Jesus Christ to give these startling words when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find the faith on the earth. And that is couched in the Greek language in such a way that the answer is, no, he will not. Now, this, of course, is not in keeping with a social gospel today, which expects to transform the world by tinkering with the social system. These vain optimists have no patience with the doleful words of 2 Timothy. And they call me an intellectual obscurantist. And whatever that is, it's not good. But nevertheless, the cold and hard facts of history and the events of the present hour demonstrate the accuracy of Paul. We are now in the midst of an apostasy which is cut to the pattern of Paul's words in remarkable detail. Now, the visible church has entered the orbit of an awful apostasy. The invisible church today is still here, and I wish it was a little more visible than it is, but it's on the way to the epiphany of glory. It's on the way to the rapture today, and it is a very comforting thought in these days in which we live. Now, the thing that's being preached today, and Paul's going to emphasize the Word of God here as he does not in any other epistle. In fact, both Paul and Peter are in agreement. Both of them wrote a swan song. 
2 Timothy and 2 Peter are that. And in both of those epistles, they put the emphasis upon the Word of God and the Gospel. Now, I'd like to say just a word or two here at this particular juncture, that the Gospel preaching rests upon a tremendous fact, and that fact is the total depravity of man, that man is a lost sinner. And someone has put it like this, and I'd like to pass it on to you, where education assumes that the moral nature of man is capable of improvement, traditional Christianity assumes that the moral nature of man is corrupt and absolutely bad. Where it is assumed in education that an outside human agent may be instrumental in the moral improvement of man in traditional Christianity, it is assumed that the agent is God and even so, the moral nature of man is not improved, but exchanged for a new one. That's very important to see. And therefore, man is in such a state that man cannot be saved by perfect obedience because he cannot render it. And he cannot be saved by imperfect obedience because God will not accept it. Therefore, the only solution is the gospel of the grace of God that reaches down and saves a sinner on the basis of the death and resurrection of Christ, and that transforms human life. We have too many cases. We have a showcase today all over this land of men and women who've been transformed by the gospel of the grace of God. Therefore, this type of liberal preaching, and I think it actually goes in three different directions. There is being preached today from the pulpit by liberalism what is really popular psychology. And it goes something like this. How to overcome. Uh, we shall overcome. It's how to think creatively. How to think affirmatively or positively. Oh, my. We're on the way, upward and onward forever. That's popular psychology. And it doesn't seem to be getting us anywhere very fast. Then the second is ethics. Well, that preaches a nice little sweet gospel, a sermonette preached by a preacherette to Christianettes. And believe me, the message goes something like this. Good is better than evil because it's nicer and it gets you into less trouble. And the thing we've said before, that the picture of the average church today, especially in liberalism, is that a mild-mannered man gets up before a group of mild-mannered people and he urges them to be more mild-mannered. And there's nothing quite as insipid as that. No wonder the Lord Jesus said, the church of Laodicea, that you're neither hot nor cold, I'm gonna vomit you out of my mouth. that make anybody sick in his tummy. And that's another reason I call these people Alka-Salsa Christians. They're not only fizz, foam, and froth, but they make you need an Alka-Salsa. Then there's the third, and that's called a social gospel. And that preaches better race relations, pacifism, social justice, the Christian social order, and it's Christian socialism, pure and simple. Now, when the real gospel is preached, and men come to Christ, we're all brothers, so you don't need all this talk about better race relation. You can't create it by forcing people together. Only the gospel of the grace of God makes a man a brother of mine, and when he does, doesn't make much difference about his skin at all. That's not the important thing. And then we need to recognize, as Martin Luther put it, God creates out of nothing. Therefore, until a man is nothing, God can make nothing out of him. And that is the message that should go out, and the only message that can affect a sin-sick world at the present time. Now, that makes this epistle here rather important, you see. Now, with that in mind, let's come here to the very first chapter, and I have labeled this in my outline, afflictions of the gospel. 
And we have in the first seven verses his introduction. He says, I, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. And you remember in first epistle, he said by the commandment of God. And we said at the time that the commandments of God reveal the will of God, but that's not the total will of God. But here it's the will of God according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus. Now, how do you accept the promise? Well, you do it by faith. The only way you can accept eternal life, he offers it to you, it's a gift. And a gift is something you have to believe in the giver, not in the gift, but the giver. And the Lord Jesus gives you eternal life when you trust him as Savior because he paid the penalty of your sin and he today can offer you heaven on the basis of your faith, your trust in him. You honor him when you believe him and you come his way. And therefore, the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus makes it clear this is the only place you can get it, friends, and it's through Christ. Now he says to Timothy, my dearly beloved son. Timothy was a great joy to the apostle Paul. And he says, grace, mercy, and peace. And as we indicated before in the first epistle, we have here the addition of mercy. And Paul needed a great deal of it. We do too. And today, God is rich in mercy. And it's from God the Father in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And the emphasis here is upon the Lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now he says, I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. Now you can add, by the way, Timothy to the prayer list of the Apostle Paul. Remember I told you that when I taught in the Bible Institute, I always had the students make a prayer list of the Apostle Paul. Every time he said he prayed for somebody, write their name down. Well, Timothy was on that prayer list. And by the way, how many preachers do you have on your prayer list? I hope you have your pastor, and I hope you have this poor preacher on the prayer list also. Now he says, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. Timothy loved Paul. That's quite obvious. And Paul loved Timothy, and that's obvious. And the very fact that Paul now is arrested and back in prison, going to be put to death, well, I tell you, that has really affected Timothy. And Paul says, I'm mindful of your tears, but I want you to know that when I get a good word from you, and if I could only see you, that would bring joy to my heart. How wonderful this is. And then he says, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that's in thee. Now, Paul came out of Judaism, but this boy, Timothy, was brought up apparently in a Christian home, which first dwelt in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice. And I am persuaded that's in thee also. Well, the faith that apparently his grandmother was a Christian, his mother was a Christian, and that had a lot to do with this young man turning to Christ. Now, verse 6, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. Now, Paul put his hand on Timothy. Why? Timothy shared with him in the gift of teaching the Word of God and getting the Word of God out. This is a very wonderful thing. And Timothy, we must remember, had a godly grandmother and a godly mother. His father was a Greek, and it's not known whether or not he ever became a child of God, but at least he had a mother and grandmother that had a great deal to do, I'm sure, with his decision. Now, we must leave off right there today, and we'll pick up right there next time. So until then, may God richly bless you, my beloved. Since we're just beginning 2 Timothy, I want to remind you that Dr. McGee prepared notes and outlines for each of our studies. Do you have yours? 
Well, to get your free copy, visit the resources section of ttb.org and download our ebook titled Briefing the Bible. Or if you'd prefer to receive an abridged paperback copy by mail, call us at 1 800 65 Bible or write to us at Box 7100, Pasadena, California 91109, or in Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario N6C 6B1. And when you call us, make sure to tell us how you listen to Through the Bible online via app or maybe on your local Christian radio station, we'd sure love to know how you listen. Tomorrow, the Bible Bus continues our journey through 2 Timothy, so hop aboard as we come by your corner. I'm Steve Schwetz, and as always, I'll be sure to save a seat just for you. We're grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners who are being used by God to take the whole word to the whole world.